for the LLC form. And, and would, would I? then we would become, let's say, directors, officers, and shareholders of this new corporation. Do we have, have our fiduciary duties changed? That's the question. The Supreme Court of Kentucky has repeatedly said that the common law, the, all, of, all of the artificial entity law is built on top of a common law foundation. It's not necessarily displaced because you change forms of doing business. So that's the basic point. So what do you think? Do you think that he and I would continue to be fiduciaries of each other so long as we continue to repose mutual trust and confidence in each other? That's what the common law says. Or is our relationship fundamentally changed because we change the type of entity that our business falls within? Hmm. We changed our legal form of doing business, but we didn't change our personal relationship. Now, if we sat down and drawing up an operating room and said, you know what, we've trusted each other for so long, now let's not trust each other anymore. Let's, let's, let's cogently sign away and, and create a new sort of relationship. Maybe that would change it if you changed it contractually and actually had knowledge that that contractual relationship was being reestablished in a different form. But I think otherwise, so, so Elizabeth and I are taking the position, which I think is solid law, case law supports it, that regardless of what form our business takes, as long as he and I have our special contextual relationship, that it's going to stay fiduciary. Now, if we bring in six new shareholders at some point, our relationship may stay the same, but we don't have that relationship with those six. They're going to have to look for other sources of any special relationship among them. So that's basically what this article is about. And we're putting the finishing touches on it, and it should be, you know, uh, published in the, in the U of L Law Review shortly, but I um, just wanted to share that with you. It's just, it's foundational, and sometimes it's fun to write a foundational article as opposed to something where you're really arguing what, some, a normative argument where you're saying what should be. In this case, we're simply describing what we think is, mm -hmm. but we couldn't find any Kentucky cases squarely in point. There was no, no Kentucky case rejecting what we were saying. Um, and note how this differs from the fiduciary duty among shareholders in closely held corporations. If, if, if Kentucky were to adopt uh, the Donahue case, for example, out of Massachusetts, then shareholders in closely held companies would be fiduciaries that have the fiduciary status. Context wouldn't matter. They'd have fiduciary status. But we're not pushing for that. We're saying that contextual fiduciary relationships should continue if they are, in fact, fiducial in character. All right, that's my little splurge. I thought it was pretty interesting to share with you, especially given the topic that we're about to address. So with that. Um, Thank you. So in, for a little bit of context on that, my presentation is from the point of view of the Donahue Steel. So just so everybody has the same point of reference to work from. So there is that in public fiduciary duty. Um, so my name is Ethan. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, Potentially conflicting, I'll oh, be warm, let's see. And potentially conflicting fiduciary duties among closely held corporations is with a specific emphasis on um, family business. So, there are four main topics that I'm going to cover. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about a specific problem uh, in succession planning, which, as we all know, it's the natural progression of business from one person to another. I'm going to talk about fiduciary duties as they relate to specific roles. And I'm going to address issues of when one person acts in two fiduciary capacities. Lastly, I'm going to talk about when those, that person who acts in those two capacities has conflicting duties. So um, this is a problem that I'm going to use for everybody just to sort of frame my discussion so that we're all aware uh, I know it's a lot easier to contextualize things whenever we're able to have something to look at and think about while I'm giving this talk. So if you guys don't care, just take a few minutes and read through this problem, and as we go through, try to keep it in the back of your mind.
So under this situation, we have to think about a few things. First, what fiduciaries does Sonny owe to his brother, kiddo, as the trustee? What fiduciary duties does Sonny owe to the company and the shareholders? And lastly, what, what is the result whenever those two relationships conflict with one another? The situation, I'll go back, uh, the situation uh, in which this kind of conflict occurs is one that most people, the patriarch or matriarch of family businesses find themselves in whenever they have several children that they would like to be the benefit, to receive the benefit financially of the business. So the uninvolved child tends to be at the mercy of the sibling uh, who has significant opportunity to exploit their position of power as a fiduciary, uh, all the while being protected by sometimes imprecise or lax uh, fiduciary standards of conduct. So the child in charge of the business, if the child wants to discharge their fiduciary duties fairly, faces a very complex dilemma. That child has to act as both the fiduciary uh, to the corporation, running the corporation in the best interests of all stakeholders, and they have to act as the trustee to the sibling, owing an undivided loyalty to that specific shareholder. So we all know family businesses are the backbone of the American economy, but they also struggle with succession planning. <coughs> and this legal uncertainty it is a significant threat to the business's survival. And an analysis of these questions uh, would be in really advantageous to understanding what business succession planning is, but it can also continue scholarly debate regarding the evolution of fiduciary duties in the trust and business ent entity uh, context. So, as we all remember from business works, the essence of a fiduciary relationship is one that's open-ended and it's where that one person exercises control over the property owned by another person or some discretionary power of one person over another. So the fiduciary has been entrusted with this power and they've been given some level of unsupervised discretion so the and also the label of fiduciary. So once this label of fiduciary attaches, the person entrusted with the power has the duty to act unselfishly and breaches of this duty tend to be uh, punished, sometimes more or less, than a breach of a contract. The extent of the unselfishness with which the fiduciary has to act uh, depends on the specific relationship that they have with the other party. The more power the fiduciary has, and the less power and control the beneficiary has, uh, the higher the duty is. The greater the independent authority to be exercised by the fiduciary, the greater the scope of his fiduciary duty. So, at the at the top of this relationship, if we think about fiduciaries generally, not necessarily one who has a fiduciary duty to a corporation, is a trustee, because um, a trustee has this stricter duty of loyalty than an agent upon who otherwise limited duty would be uh, conferred, the trustee has almost complete control over the, the, the trust, so what the beneficiary will receive. So as we all know, um, and as Kentucky statute reflects, there are two main elements to fiduciary uh, duties, the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and there's a third one, uh, which states that uh, it's a good faith requirement, which I'll talk about later. But the duty of care is the duty to perform competently and includes the duty to carry out the fiduciary purpose. So they have to be prudent in their actions, they have to protect the property entrusted to them in their fiduciary capacity, they have to not commingle uh, the fiduciary's assets with their own, they have to invest prudently and properly which may include a duty to diversify. They have to account to the beneficiaries and they have to be impartial uh, in the treatment of persons who hold an interest in the property. This duty of loyalty is a duty of unselfish, uh, unselfishness. It's the duty to refrain from exploiting a relationship for personal gain and to refrain from taking any benefit from the relationship other than reasonable compensation. 
So as I mentioned, the trustee is the most vertical uh, of this relationship because the beneficiary has no control. Um, the beneficiary is restricted to monitoring the trustee's actions and they have very limited ability to exit the fiduciary relationship. So there are also no monitoring mechanisms in place to protect the beneficiary of a trust. Um, courts don't really give any scrutiny to what a trustee does um, until they've done something horribly wrong. So what, how do we describe this gold standard of a trustee's fiduciary duty? The duty under common law prohibits self-dealing except when the settler of the trust authorized the transaction for, or all of the beneficiaries consented after full disclosure. Self-dealing includes not only transactions between the trust and the trustee, uh, but it could also include those transactions between the trust and an alter ego of the trustee, such as a straw man, a close relative, or a closely held corporation. So whether their relationship between the trustee and third party to the transaction is close enough to trigger the self-dealing rules is usually a question of fact. The hallmark of a trustee's duty of care is to minimize risk. The trustee must accept only that level of overall risk that's appropriate in light of the circumstances. The trustee's duty of care has been phrased as one that is of caution. As stated in the comments of the Uniform Prudent Investor Act, a trust whose main purpose is to support an elderly widow of modest means will have a lower risk tolerance than a trust to accumulate for a young son of great wealth. So this duty of care includes the duty to delegate responsibility, uh, which originally uh, was not the duty to delegate, but when by necessity it evolved uh, into the duty to delegate. So long as the trustee used reasonable care, skill, and caution in selecting an agent and monitoring their actions. This duty of care can generally be relaxed by the trust instrument, but that cannot be eliminated. Well, the fundamental requirement that trustees behave uh, recklessly but act in good faith with some suitable degree of care and in a manner consistent with the terms and purpose of the trust. As long as it's consistent with those terms, um, that duty alone can't be eliminated, but most others can. In the corporate setting, the board of directors and the corporate officers are fiduciary for the corporation. The duty of care is particularly weakened in a corporate setting. A typical statement of the duty of care is a duty of the corporation to perform the director's or officer's function in good faith in a manner that he or she reasonably believes in the best interest of the corporation and with care that an ordinary prudent person would reasonably be expected to exercise in a like position under similar circumstances. So this, we all know, is the business judgment rule. The business judgment rule sometimes can leave a court wondering whether or not they've done enough to hold the fiduciary responsible for their actions. But a court may not want to elect to hold the fiduciary responsible under the much more stringent trustee fiduciary duty. Several courts have wrestled with this issue, and as courts in different states have taken varied approaches, even whenever they are evaluating the trustee director's conduct. In Rosencrantz versus Fry, defendant trustee sought authority to sell himself shares of stock to which he had been given an option to purchase pursuant a testator's will. Plaintiff beneficiary filed a complaint seeking to restrain the defendant's sale and purchase of the shares. The court held that the defendant was entitled to receive the shares of stock and that the trust was entitled to receive the monies generated by the sale of stock. The court further held that there is no basis in the record to find that the defendant had breached his duty as a trustee by omitting to declare a dividend prior to exercising his option to buy. So under this situation, the court said what we would normally consider is kind of a weird place for a fiduciary to exercise their discretion because they had the option under the will to purchase uh, the shares. And even though they are dealing with the trust itself, we're gonna allow it because it was contemplated under the will itself, right? So as I mentioned before, testators have huge latitude in picking and choosing who their fiduciaries are. 
And in a succession plan, that's incredibly important whenever they're making the decision about to whom to leave their business. Because they've generated all this goodwill for years. And they're also considering their second child who would benefit from the business doing well as a beneficiary to the trust. So there are a lot of factors in play and, and really strange interplay of those fiduciary duties. New York, in contrast, has taken a very clear stance. So they have definitively held that the trustee level fiduciary is the one that prevails. So not the lower business judgment standard, but the much higher fiduciary duty of a trustee. They said that where a trustee holds working control of stock in an owned corporation, he is accountable in the probate court for the administration of the corporate affairs. Okay? So the court recognizes the executor or trustee may not use the corporate character as a shield to protect himself from or, or censure from uh, where the fiduciaries control a corporation by help of an estate. So New York's court held that uh, the duty of trustees as personal representatives, they have to ma maintain that high standard. The Georgia Supreme Court has a much more nuanced understanding of the duty of fiduciaries whenever they hold both the title of director of a corporation and also a trustee. They said that uh, the trustee level fiduciary standard, which the lower court had based on that New York case I discussed earlier, they said that wasn't going to work. They said it may be appropriate as a general rule, but because of, as the facts that we have in our hypothetical, uh, there are much more difficult questions about to whom the duty is owed and which one makes the most sense in a business setting. So they recognize that trustee managers are generally subject to that trust level fiduciary standard, the high one. Under the, under the facts of the Rollins case, uh, the court found that the corporate level, so the business judgment rule, was the one that was more appropriate to evaluate the trustee's conduct as director of the corporation. Several other courts have considered this, uh, New Jersey among them, but overall, the courts take a series of factors into deciding uh, whether or not to apply that lower level of review or that higher level of review. First is the claimant's interest of minority. So kiddo's interest in this instance, 20% or 40%, right? So that means Sonny and the min other minority shareholders make up a majority. The next question is whether or not the testator considered the dual relationship and whether they considered uh, which relationship they considered to be more important. Is it more important that Sonny do what's best for the business so that kiddo can benefit from that? Or is it more important that Sonny look out for kiddo's interest over the business? Lastly, the courts will consider which duty was most harmed by a particular course of action. So if the testator had that intent, and the, the director trustee makes the decision, well, in this instance, it's way more important for me to protect kiddo's interest in the corporation. Um, even if the corporation will be gravely harmed, right? that's whenever the court may decide, well, we'll apply the lower standard. A key question from all this is whether or not the trustee director's conduct um, should take the needs of the beneficiary into account. Courts are constantly wrestling with this question. So for example, if the beneficiary of the trust is elderly and the trust is their primary source of income, that would seem to dictate that the trustee business manager needs to avoid risks such as expansion or development that would put a strain on the business's finances. This conflict is similar to that of a trustee's conflict between serving an income beneficiary or a remainder beneficiary. And trust law, in particular, has responded by imposing a duty of impartiality. Now, this duty of impartiality requires that the trustee straddle the interest of the two and not favor one over the other. So, in the scenario that I just proposed, 
the trustee business director would have to consider both the interest of the business and the interest of the elderly beneficiary. So this impartiality approach may be too modest, right? Because it doesn't really allow the business trustee business director the flexibility that he or she needs to make decisions um, because of that impartial relationship. So the duty of care owed by the fiduciary may be an issue that's easier for us to tackle. The risk taking necessary to run a business and the ability to be free from a requirement of diversifying risk, they both face constraints from the trustee's duty of care. A trustor, the person to whom, uh, the person who is writing the trust, granting the trust, they have significant power to reduce that duty of care as long as the trustee still acts in good faith. This power with the trustor, together with the implication that the trustor intended to reduce the duty of care, should be enough to create a presumption that the dual role should be lesser, so the corporate duty, business trust rule, right? That's my proposal. So in turn, your petitioner, plaintiff, the person to whom the duty is owed, could rebut that presumption by statements of contrary intent of the trustor at the time they were alive. So this would, this would give us enough leeway and flexibility as opposed to the duty of impartiality under this review for the fiduciary to make decisions uh, about their duty of care and how to best exercise that. There are problems with this kind of approach. Dropping the duty down from the highest to that uh, under the business judgment <clears throat> would disregard the beneficiary status in way more sensitive contexts, right? So, uh, of course, that, that stricter rule, it's far too limiting uh, and doesn't allow the business director to take risk that often associated with the enterprise. So, as I said a minute ago, the duty should be somewhere in between. Court should explicitly recognize that the position of the fiduciary to the business entity requires the fiduciary to balance the best interest of both. They have to weigh what the interest of, in, the, in this dual role, they have to weigh what the business, the interest of the business and corporation is against the interest of the trust, uh, the beneficiary of the trust, and they have to make a decision about which one is going to cause less harm. Now, whenever we're talking about a derivative action here, which is what would be brought whenever a fiduciary violates their duty, court should not second guess that business determination that they make under those circumstances. Right? So, be, and like I said, guys, this is a really complicated area of the law, and as Professor Warren mentioned, Kentucky doesn't have a whole lot of case law on this issue, so we have to look to other places to be instructive. So this best interest rule would apply in circumstances where the fiduciary would be able to enter into transaction under the rules of one role, such as the beneficiary or the fiduciary of a corporation, but not under the other role, so that of a trustee. That would give the dual fiduciary the freedom and flexibility to make determinations that have massive implications for the business, whether uh, without the fear of a court second guessing their determination. So where would this new rule lead Sunny? So long as Sonny can say that he was put in a position where that he had to balance the interest of the entity and his brother, kiddo, and as long as he exercised those three elements, he, he did his duty of care, he, he had a good faith belief for doing so, uh, and
So and as long as he did it with the care of an ordinary prudent person, uh, he would be able to assert uh, a defense in this derivative action. But regardless of Sonny's fate, uh, as the ownership of closely held family businesses entities, business entities by trust become more common, we all can anticipate that this intersection of trust law and business law will be the subject of a lot more litigation. As we try to figure out, whenever per people hold these dual duties, as both a director of a corporation and a, a trustee of um, their parents' you know, trust, we're gonna be litigating this increasingly more as we try to figure out where we draw these lines and who acts appropriately. Okay, I know that was a lot to unload on you guys all at once, and I'm sorry for that. But does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Uh, why do you think Kentucky has such little case law on it to this point? Because I mean, typically Kentucky has a higher number of family-owned corporations that qualify as small businesses than most other jurisdictions. Well, I think in part because you know, like I said at the beginning, this is most of this case law is based on the Donnie. So Kentucky, this, the, the basis from which they have to work is statutory, and I think it's a lot more, trial courts make decisions, and it's in appellate level courts, so your state court of appeals just aren't eager to take those up yet. Because this is such a new area, it's really difficult for them to make up their mind about what they want. And Professor uh, maybe Warren may be able to talk about that. Yeah, I think the first thing that strikes me about your article is that, or your presentation, is the incredibly difficult position that kind of succession plan puts this, puts Sonny in, right? And whether he can serve the dual role if his primary obligation as the Probably, you know, he's probably chair of the board. He's certainly on the board of directors. He's probably the CEO, uh, as per his father's wishes. Um, he controls 80% of the stock of the company by virtue of his own individual ownership and his position as trustee or type titular holder of the stock. Um, and his and his and his brother comes in and says, "I want you know dividends all the time." You've also got. 20% of the company owned by other family members who may be more or less in agreement with Sonny that, you know, we're all okay. Uh, the business needs to be fairly capital, fairly capital intensive for now because dad has died and he renewed the business. Not a time for us to drain off cash right. when the, the company's in trouble due to the leadership change. So, you know, so it seems like Sonny's primary job would be to protect the interests of the, of, the, of the company. And in doing so, he tends to protect the interest of Sonny right. as a beneficiary of the trustee. On the other hand, if Sonny's out there with, 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 with no job and no money and perhaps has the flu or something worse, you know, that's, that's the rub, right? Because then if I'm Sonny, I'm thinking, I can't really, you know, I can, I, uh, by owning, what is the scope of my fiduciary? So you know you're a fiduciary if you're a trustee, but what is the scope of Sonny's fiduciary responsibility to kid up? If it's just to hold, if it's solely to hold that stock, then you could say, well, then the stock is, uh, is it represents the wealth of kid up. And, um, by protecting the company, I'm protecting Kiddo's wealth. Right. Kiddo's going to be fierce and say, well, you ought to be protecting me. And I guess Sonny would say, through you as his lawyer perhaps, that no, the scope of my relationship does not include taking care of you and making sure you're happy. Uh, my relationship is, is, is intended by our father is to protect the asset, keep you from squandering it. Exactly. So in that sense, the he could probably succeed in, and render his his dual fiduciary duty, the performance of his dual fiduciary duties, given the scope of his fiduciary duty in both roles, consistent with each other. Yeah, and I would say 
97% of the time that would be true. 3 percent's gone in that lot of guys. Yeah, and the, and the difficulty comes whenever kiddo makes the cousins mad, and they say, well, we've got, you know, we've got our 20%, and Sonny's got his 40%. Together we have 60. So what we want to do is try to put the squeeze on kiddo because he's causing us all these problems. He's wanting to... But kiddo can't vote. No, he can't. So, uh, but uh, kiddo, you know, it's a family operation. We can't just consider the legal status. There's also all of these relationships, social relationships. Drama. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, legally, kiddo may not be able to leverage very much, but in the personal lives of all the cousins, kiddo can wreak havoc. So, you know, that the moments where the, the cousins look out at the landscape and say, in 10 years, this is gonna be a huge problem for us, and as a, as a fiduciary to the business, Sonny, you need to do something. And Sonny says, well, I can, I'm also kiddo's trustee. That's, well, that's where the conflict if, really occurs. If, if you guys are the lawyers representing Pop, uh, before his death, so you've been asked by Pop to write a succession plan. And again, it was never my area, but I, I, would, I would think that, that you would advise Pop, knowing that Pop is putting Sonny in a position of running the company, so he's going to, have, he's going to be wearing all kinds of fiduciary hats as, as an officer, director, controlling shareholder, and a fiduciary hat, at least maintaining this share of stock for the, for, for the, for the, for the younger brother. Wouldn't it be wise, and they're probably their better methods, but wouldn't it be wise to say, all right, Dad, go ahead and name me trustee, but go ahead and name an independent successor trustee like PNC Bank, mm -hmm. because if things start getting hot, you know, I don't want to deal with that. You know, I don't want to deal with that. Um, and, and, and the bank will. And the bank will then decide whether its job is trustee, not of kiddo, that's a big distinction, right? But if kiddo's property, um, then they can they can measure out what their performance, they'll have to determine what their scope is and, 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 and what kind of performance they want. They want to give in fulfilling whatever scope they determine they have. But it takes Sonny out, because in my view, Sonny's, that's what's, I mean, you didn't, you, 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 maybe you went the other way on this in your presentation, but it seems to me if Sonny is representing the controlling person of this entire business, which involves 50 other people, um, that his probably primary duty is run to the company and the shareholders collectively and not to get up. Yeah, and that, you know, whenever I mentioned the fact that the, the testator's intent is hugely important whenever courts consider the duty of the trustee because the testator, the testator can waive a lot of those in their, in their device. So, in my brain, and as I was working through this hypo, it made a lot of sense for me, well, there's an implicit assumption in some courts, that's how far they've taken it, that if a trustee has made this person the dual fiduciary, that they implicitly waive that, that they recognize that it's a conflict. <laughs> now, some courts require express waivers, so they have to that's say- That's interesting. I know yeah. that there are, and it, it is a fascinating area, and it's, um, because it's so hard to find the underlying common law policies, you know, because I've always read scholars who have been studying, you know, my counterparts, other schools who have devoted their, their entire lives to this area. So, uh, one of whom I know is, is, is Donald Langbord at Georgetown, who he would say that the testator <coughs> can certainly limit the fiduciary responsibilities of the, of the, of the, of the trustee mm -hmm. he names, but he can't, he can't waive breaches of trust of fiduciary duty in advance, right. and, he, and he can't completely exculpate no. uh, the trustee down the road. The common law represents important public policy. Yeah. And, and it can't uh, be overridden by a test day. Right. And there are limits to what they can waive. Right. So reckless behavior or behavior that is so clearly detrimental, they can't right. waive that. Yeah. And, and, and you go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and, and you'll find the line in different places um, as to how far a testator can go and eliminate fiduciary responsibilities given the strong public policy underlying fiduciary duties generally because that, it's, it's, it's the strong helping the weak, it's the person with all the power having all the responsibility, 
which I thought was a very good part of your presentation, because with you know, the underlying, one of the underlying tenets of law in general is that the greater the responsibility, the greater the power, the greater the responsibility. The sort of correlative. And where this is a relatively, believe it or not, simple fact pattern for this issue, oftentimes Pop will appoint three trustees, all of which who still have an interest in this business. So he'll have, you know, it may be his wife and his, you know, whoever. Uh, there will be three or four of them, and they're all disagreeing about everything, and nobody can decide what to do with the business. So it's completely gridlocked. And this same problem comes up in other contexts, including obviously the the, the whole area of, 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 of T and E and estate law, right? Because think about this person. Let's assume you have your mother or father is very old, and they've got whatever the other spouse left them, and uh, they know they're not going to live forever, and they want to name you since you're the lawyer, is the personal representative of the estate. But let's say you know in advance you've got some cantankerous siblings. And uh, the siblings are married to some, some cantankerous people too. And uh, um, if you're doing, so, so if you put yourself in that position, then you sort of put your client in the same position and, and think to yourself, there too, you might want to have a, a successor trustee named by your, your, your parent. Yeah. And kept, because if it gets hot, you really don't, life's too short for you to be in the middle of that. So you. You, you, may always, you may say, I can resign at any time and tell your other siblings, hey, I, don't want, I don't need this heat. You know, life's too short. I'm going to resign and let PNC Bank take over or some other institution where they know that then they're, then they're dealing with the cold, hard metal right. of, 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 of objective metal, if you will, of, 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 a, of an institution that really wants to do the most conservative things possible. And they're not going to negotiate much with, with the other siblings. No, and you know, I, I did kind of mention it, but I didn't really get the chance to highlight it because the social aspect of succession plans is just as important as the legal aspect. It is. Because you've got your dad who clearly favors one son over the other, but has this, you know, feels like he's responsible for the son who hasn't really I done think most parents probably feel yeah. that way, right? Yeah. So, you know, Pops feels like he has to try to do something to protect the second child, even though there's not been much of an effort. So the, I can imagine there's tons of research on uh, the interpersonal relationships in these kinds of decisions. You mean social science research? Yeah, yeah. There probably is. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. But it, is the yeah. buyout option not uh, acting in, in the best interest of Kiddo's portion and Kiddo's, I guess, trust? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely could be. It seems um, like that was written in by Pop or at least yeah, well, and, and that's exactly, there was a, I think it was from New Jersey, one of the cases where that a, a trustee had the option, a trustee director had the option to buy the shares of the trust. And there was a question of whether or not, the reason why it got into litigation, there was a question or not about whether or not they had to declare dividends before they bought those shares. So um, it's a really interesting case basically about, well, did he have a fiduciary duty to do that because it was in the best interest of the trust, but it was in a bad interest of the corporation, right? So um, that, and that's the reason why I mentioned this fact pattern is because there, as for valuation, there's a really serious question about if you know that it's going to be valued today a lot less than it will be in six months, have that duty to the trust and to the corporation. What do you, what do you do? Well, you could you could always you know, pop before he dies could secure a respectable valuation from from an appraisal firm, and come up with a number that would sort of equate Kiddo and Sonny's inheritance, but with but with Sonny getting all the stock, and and Kiddo getting the cash. Um, I want to say in the case that I read, it was they pop val or the parent valued it at like twenty five dollars per share, and the sibling bought it for fifty. So that it was clearly to the benefit of the trust whenever they bought it, which was really strange. So, and, so in, in your example, kiddo would have come out pretty well. Yeah. Because and, and still, if the kids are spendthrift, you can put it in a, a you know in a, in a, in a revocable or an irrevocable trust. 
that would run him out to his 40s before he get the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that honestly, that's why whenever courts are looking at these issues, they consider the financial situation of the beneficiary. Because if it is someone who's income dependent on this trust versus someone who, well, this is just kind of, you know, some some money that they're going to have for spare change, you know, spare. Right, and that's the area of, of trust law I've never delved into much, which means that you can, you can be a trustee of property, but you can also be trustee in the, in the sense that you're sort of personal guardian, which carries with it a lot more weight. That clearly would put Sonny in direct conflict with other duties. Yeah. Um, and that's what Pop needs to, or you're the lawyer for Pop, you need, to, you need to come up with devices. And I think there's room for a lot of creativity here. Oh, yeah. You know, um, and sort of imagining, and that's why your presentation is really good, imagining what the, the social dynamics will be and, and, and setting up a structure that is likely to, to avoid conflict going forward. Yeah, I mean, you, and this is one of the reasons why I was really excited to talk about this is because there are so many pitfalls. So Pop could have made a plan where that Sonny got 100% of the business and Kiddo got 100% of his personal assets. But the problem is, you know, assuming Pop was just flush with uh, cash and houses and everything, problem is, Kiddo is going to be able to squander that pretty quickly. And Pop probably knows that. But Pop doesn't have any other kids than Sonny. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, well, now I've given Sonny the business and also complete control over my personal assets. Allegedly mm-hmm. to the benefit of Kiddo. So there are really difficult questions. Um, but if, Pian, if, if, if Pop had left the 40% to Sonny, and put kiddos 40% in a trust at PNC, then, and, 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 and PNC's responsibilities were limited to um, uh, prudent management of the trust property, then, then they don't really have to pay a lot of attention to, to kiddo nope. going forward, unless the, tr- unless the trust itself specified other duties for the trustee PNC to assume, which it probably would, it might not. Right. But again, it might, in which event you got a different outcome. But in any event, the, the bank shouldn't have a conflict with, they're not a controlling person of the company, so they're not gonna have a conflict with, with the company itself. Yeah, and, and really, I think that that is where, you know, good lawyering comes in, because then you can convince your client that is that actually superior for them to go to the bank than it is for them to give the other part of the interest to their second child. Yeah. Right. So you really have to be an advocate in that situation to convince your client that that is actually what's best for them and their interests and their kids' interests. Right. You could also, I'm just making this up, right? <laughs> you could also, rest- Pop could restructure could recapitalize the corporation. And I know recapitalize is a big word, but it doesn't necessarily have a big meaning. But by recapitalize, it means he could he could split his stock. He could he could reclass he could but by many of the articles he could reclassify his own own stock as is is um, class A and class B. And the class A could have the voting rights. And that's what he leaves to to the Sunny. And leaves the remainder to Kiddo but with no voting rights. So mm-hmm. the kiddo isn't ganging up with the cousins on Sonny. Right. Which would be disastrous in this situation right. for the business. Do you have a question also? Yeah, my, uh, I guess is the majority of these cases going, or I guess they'd be issues, of, or who's getting sued, I guess is my question. Yeah. Um, so how much of it's malpractice against the attorney that was doing the estate planning, and how much of it's uh, um, allocated to the trustee issue? Uh, everything that I've seen is allocated to the trustee issue about to whom the fiduciary duty was owed and whether or not they breached that duty by acting, by making some kind of a business decision. So there was one instance where the, uh, a guy had left his wife as the beneficiary of a trust and appointed his longtime best friend and co-manager of the business as the director. Right? Uh, so the wife is, is, tr- is trustee. Yeah, it's trustee. So uh, 
The wife also sat on the board of directors for the corporation. So she is both the beneficiary of the trust, so gave her some portion of the shares, uh, and she, she sits on the board of directors, and the, the manager got votes on the board too because he moved up. So the wife moved, wanted to do just what Kiddo wanted to do. She wanted to get more money. So she, as on the board, she pushed the board to get more dividends. Well, the old friend said, no, we're not going to do that. We need to keep capital in the company because we have all these plans. You know, we're, we're not going to take that risk right now. So she sued him because he refused to issue dividends. Said he had a duty under the trust to make sure that she was able to pay for whatever it was she was wanting. I can't remember. And he breached that because that trustee duty, fiduciary duty is so high. Um, she was elderly, you know, that was one of those situations where that it was more than just management of the property, it was also management of her as an, an older woman. Right. So she sued under that principle. Rather, I mean, and the court said, well, like, what do we do? He had to exercise his business judgment in deciding not to issue these dividends. Wearing that other hat. Wearing the other hat. Are we supposed to hold him responsible for violating the fiduciary duty of the trust or for violating the fiduciary duty of the business. And that's where these people are faced with really complicated decisions, and that's why, more or less, I say we should, there should be a presumption of the lower standard unless it's rebutted. If that, I know that was a long answer, I'm sorry. Well, no, but he gets business judgment rule protection in his, in his role as a corporate fiduciary, but he doesn't necessarily in his role as a, tr as a, a trustee of the property and of the income trust. So presumably it's an income trust. So not only does the trust hold the property, it holds some performance responsibilities in terms of whatever income comes from those shares, it gets distributed to kiddo in accordance with his needs going forward. And I don't know how banks do that. I mean, it's, 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 it's obviously, they, they have standards yeah. that are established uh, in terms of how they um, I mean, this happens every day, right? People get left fairly decent sized estates to a surviving spouse, and she might live 50 years. And of course, you know, the, 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 the kids and the stepkids and everybody else would like to have the money now. Mm -hmm. So they're hoping she dies, you know, to be gruesome. And, um, and at some point, is, is the remainder beneficiaries, they may be angry with the bank. And you end up with litigation about the bank overpaying the widow or widower yep. during this period of time. So, the, so you know standards have to have emerged. So if you do get in litigation, you know you're going to need to bring in people who've served as trustees of these kind of trusts as experts on what the standard care is, because they're not going. No matter what it looks like, the court is always going to be faced with, all right. Was there a fiduciary duty? If so, what was the scope of that fiduciary duty? And third, did the fiduciary act in accordance with the standards of the profession, which is why you bring in the expert who's going to say, right on a blackboard, here's what those standards are, and, and I've reviewed the facts, in my view, without reaching an ultimate conclusion, is that this party, uh, this, this trustee, act in accordance with the applicable standards of care. And then you've got resolution, presumably. Um, and I've seen I've seen trustees who are actually business trustees brought in as experts, but very often lawyers are brought in as experts. And I've explained this recently in our business arts class. They're brought in because lawyers are the ones that tell trustees what their fiduciary duties are. And that trustees in turn have to develop practices. But the lawyer may also inform those best practices as part of his or her responsibility in advising the client. Yeah, and the corporate documents also can set out the duties of directors. But not the standards of care against no. which breach no. of those duties will be measured. And I left law school super confused about this. Yeah. See, in law school you learn all these duties, and you don't learn anything about standards. Now obviously, if a building collapses, we know the architect had a duty of care to, that's the duty, and there might even be a, not only a common law, but a statutory form of that duty. But when he is alleged to have breached it, somebody has to talk about what are the standards of care of an architect. So we obviously don't learn that in law school. Right. But we do learn, we should be learning what the standards of care are 
of directors because we're the ones that advise directors as to what they ought to do. You know, attend board meetings, you know, read the stuff. Don't ignore corporate hemorrhages when you show up those four times a year. You know, read the minute book. Um, so we do help set standards for, 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 for fiduciaries in general. We certainly set standards for other lawyers. We all know that. We set standards for fiduciaries to some degree, but we don't set standards for medical doctors or architects. But remember, standards are critical because you got to, it's one thing to allege duty, breach, damages. You get when you're talking about breach and causation. You got when you're talking about breach, you got to you got to establish that here are the standards in this context, and here's what he or she did. Okay. And if there's a substantial departure from those standards, then we call that negligence. If there's a reckless departure, we call that gross negligence, which can allow punitive damages. Any other questions, Clay? Okay. Very good job. Thanks for Thank having me. Okay, class, next time we have uh, Brett Jones, who's going to, who comes to going to talk to us. He literally can go the full two hours, this guy. He, I told you, he was, he always was here for, just like these other presenters, for 45 minutes. And then, and then well, he would stay and listen to Clay, but his presentation would last 45 minutes. And he somehow forgot, because one time he shows up and says, you mean I only have an hour? I said, well, sorry, Brett, next time I'll arrange for you to have the whole class. So he wants the whole class, and he'll use most of it. Hopefully he'll stop in time for you guys to ask some questions. But he really created uh, this, this pharmaceutical company from scratch after having won the first vote award. You know, our, our battery guy won the vote award, but I think now they spread it out among five to ten recipients. But he won the first one. And uh, way back, I guess, 20 years ago, and uh, I guess it's 15 to 20 years ago. And um, he, he'll tell you more about it. But his, his, after he got the award, his, the, 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 the very famous research doctor from Europe working with him disappeared. Just disappeared off the place. They never found him. He, lay, he went back to Europe. I mean, he didn't die, <laughs> but, he, but he just didn't show up again. So. So Brett said, well, I guess I should go return the vote award. So he went back and tried to give it back to him. And they said, we're not going to accept it. You're going to have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so he's continued building his company uh, since that time. So I think it'll be very interesting. All right, you can go early today. I will see you next week. You going home? You want to watch again? Did you send a copy of your slides? Oh. Uh, I think I can put it on Blackboard. Okay, is that how you do it? Because I was going to ask you how you're going to do it. I, I didn't know how to find it. Yeah. Send me a hard copy by email. Okay. 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 Roster up there? On Blackboard? Yeah, on Blackboard. Okay. Okay. Because I still have to do that. All right, thank you. Did everybody check the... Okay. Yeah. I need some water. I'll wait for your turn. TG! Uh, the coolest person in the All the time. How is going to Auburn with a fun? Yeah. Seems pretty cool. Michigan State. Oh, that sounds fun too, though. It was fun. It was fun. I went to Oklahoma State uh, for a year or something. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm Michigan sure. Like yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. It was fun. It was fun. And we were good at basketball and football at the time, yeah. so that's cool. Hey, sorry. hey how you doing? Dude. A lot of credits. You don't have to explain anything no, to me. Yours was fine.
But like, I, said, I just like, you know, I've heard everything. Not no, for me. You should see the text messages she just sent me. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. For me, I was just like, you said you were overwhelmed. I understood that. I'm mm-hmm. like, she, you did it the right way and I told pretty much everybody that. I don't think I told anybody else. Yeah. But the other one, I was like, you know, the first time. And I wasn't great with the emails and learning, but. I mean, yeah. yeah, but like, you know, so I wanted to talk to you about it for like a really long time. Don't worry but, about me. I'm. But I never did. And so I'm now fine. I'm just, okay. Well, come here. We gotta hug. Ah, you. yeah. I hope like, you're doing great. You and I were friends, and we could, like, we never talked about it. So I didn't know if, like, that was what we were doing. I was like, you know, because, like, I see you and I, I want to say hi, but I feel like. Don't feel weird. I'm like, I don't want him to hate me. Like, I didn't. Because I thought. I, I, I know what you're saying. And so, I mean, I think that if anything, like, she told me that she didn't want to talk to me anymore, among other things. What? And really? so, yeah. And so, okay. you know, like, she. See you, buddy. Hey. Hey. Yeah, I mean, No, don't worry about it. And, okay. I, and I feel bad that I even made you feel bad. Well, That's what, and it was just like, I've I been didn't feeling bad at all. I got so many people I got to apologize no, to, really. No, so. Not at all. And so that was just kind of like on me because like, I always thought that I should have like talked to you about it because I kind of had to like that. And I was just like, it wasn't even the case. Like, I didn't do it because I was like, well, she's not doing it, so I'm not doing it either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was more like, don't worry. We're, we're completely fine. I quit, fine. like, everything. Like, I quit jail. <laughs> so, All right. Well, here, go ahead and get the close. Great Thanks job, man. Dude. All right, see, so you killed it. Like, I like the hypothetical thing. Yeah. That's that was good. That was nice. Well, there are, like, four areas in the pro- in which fiduciary duties. Are you coming this way or no? No, but I'll walk oh. with you for a second. Oh, well, all right. Good. Uh, so I just picked one. Okay. And that was the one I picked. That was, I like how you did it and then it kept us a little, you know, awake more yeah. than others. <laughs> yeah.